Okay, we're live. Callum, thank you for coming on today. I really appreciate you. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Me too, man. Thanks for having me on. Hell yeah. So let's get right into it. So you were a former uh, strategy consultant in New York, and you just recently made the switch to being a podcaster. So my question is, like, out of all the things you could have done, um, leaving your job, why podcasting? Yeah, like, um, good question. And definitely like a journey of like how I came to that point. Um, so I'm originally, I'll kind of start in the beginning. Like I'm originally from London, like grew up in the UK, uh, born and raised, like went to school out there, went to university out there. When I graduated, I moved over to the States. Um, and my first job was in strategy consulting. So like very corporate, um, like, you know, you start off as an analyst, you're like the guy that's like doing like the PowerPoint decks and like aligning shit. Uh, I think people call it like the grunt work. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, like I learned a bunch from doing it, but it just didn't suit my personality. Like I've always been someone that's like very entrepreneurial. Um, and I like to just like make shit happen. Like I don't like to wait. I like to just, I like for things to be happening and like things to be moving forward. So uh, we can go into a few of the stories, but like I would just do shit that just you wouldn't do as a strategy consultant if you're working in like a corporate company. So it just wasn't, um, it wasn't a great fit, although it was a, it was a good start to my career. Um, so I left that to go to basically do like the complete opposite. So I went from like kind of like a corporate environment to like a super early stage um, fintech app called Otis. I think when I joined, we had about like 15, 20 employees. So I went from like a company with like hundreds, probably like thousands of people to like 15 people and being in like team meetings and with, with the CEO and he's asking you like your opinion on like strategy decisions. And um, so just a complete 180. Um, and then that company got acquired by a bigger startup, about 200 people. Um, and then I worked there for nine months and kind of like midway through my time at Otis, I had just decided, um, I knew that I wanted to build some sort of brand online. Um, and we can kind of, if you want, we can go into like why, like how I came to that realization. Cause I actually think it's, it's valuable for people. Um, but I knew I wanted to build some sort of brand online. So I actually started with Twitter. I would like follow people, um, you know, they would be like writing the threads and like just writing content and they were building like big followings. And it wasn't, I think the thing that kind of reassured me at the time, it wasn't just like amazing CEOs who had already had like successful exits or were running like public companies that were building followings. It was like kind of normal people as well, like people that were like working or just doing normal shit. Um, so I was like, okay, why don't I just try right on Twitter? I didn't really want to put like my face out there and all that shit. I was like, why don't I just start with this? And so I actually did um, Sean Puri's like power writing course, really good course that kind of like teaches you how to write um in a way and in a format so that you go viral. Um, and after that call, doing that course, I actually wrote a Twitter thread about how I got my first job in consulting, kind of like an interesting story behind that, but how I got my first job in consulting and that went viral. Like it got retweeted uh, by Sean and then like a bunch of other people uh, ended up getting like, I think like 300,000 impressions. And at the time I had like 50 followers. So I went from like 50 to like close to a thousand just based off uh that thread um so I kind of had the wind in my sails from that and I was like okay I'm just gonna be hammering it on Twitter like this is my thing and so every week I was like one tweet thread a week was like in my mind and so I maybe did that for like three four weeks and I was getting good traction like just using the what he had taught in the class and like um things that I was interested in but like it was so painful for me to do it like I could, like I was writing threads and I was like, I like really don't like this. Like, um, I have this thing, I even say it on my pod, which is, I think everyone has their own style of communication. Like if anyone's listening, there's a style of communication that is uniquely suited to you. Um, so for some people that's writing, 
for some people it's like um very visual like maybe like you're an artist um for some people and like for me it's speaking like well I hope I should be at this point <laughs> if I'm a podcaster but like I think I'm good at talking so like um writing was just so painful for me man like having to sit down and be like okay you need to write out like a thread every week I was like I can't do this and um the thing with content like you have to be able to do it for a long time like that's the key in about being successful you have to be able to like outlast everyone and like just do it for a long time and so I kind of switched out of doing that but I knew I wanted to keep building a brand so I was like let's try the podcasting um I listened to a bunch of podcasts like I was always into it even growing up so I was like let me try it uh the initial goal was just to record 10 episodes I after I recorded my fourth episode I was like I was convinced like I was hooked and then since then it's been like okay let's record like hundreds thousands of episodes and that's been like the mission since then yeah that is such an interesting origin story of how you stumbled into it and (laughs) Dude, you make such a good point about like to be a content creator in the long run. Like you have to commit to this stuff for the long game. And there's some stat out there. I I might be butchering the number, but it's like 95% of podcasts don't make it to episode four. And so Mm. I find it interesting that you really realized like this was your thing at episode four. And then from there, it's like if you post, let's say one a week for a year, like, and you have a long-term perspective, that's 500 episodes 10 years from now. And mm-hmm. that's just the start of your journey. And then you're creating connections, building a network. That's why I love podcasting as a medium myself. Um, but yeah, I find mm-hmm. it interesting that you stumbled down this path of like Twitter, then podcast, because the same thing happened for me. And I actually was going to be this strategy consultant too, uh, oh, really? myself. Um, yeah, I... I really thought I was going to go the corporate route just because I didn't know, like I didn't know any other option. And then I started to realize, okay, every single time I do something and I have more autonomy and I have more control over what I do, I'm so much more motivated. And when I was working at a big time, like corporate internship with hundreds of employees, I felt I had no autonomy or like even weight or decision behind anything I was doing. So it seems like for you, it was the same thing because you went from big time consulting company to a little bit of a smaller startup where you probably had more decision making and input. And then now like you're running your own thing. So mm-hmm. have you always been somebody that has really valued like your own stuff and setting your own goals and stuff like that? Yeah, hundred percent. Like even to, to add on to your point, I think, um, everyone the thing I say I'll never say to anyone like you have to be an entrepreneur or you have to go this route um you really just want to find what your thing is and I think the thing that I've seen is that the journey of finding your thing there's a ton of uncertainty like you have to just try a lot of different things and that involves doing a lot of things that you don't like doing like I've spent a lot of time I've I've only been in my career for for four years now, but I spent a lot of time doing shit that I didn't like. And I think that is, that's a crucial part of the journey because that shows you what you do like. And I think sometimes what I see, um, even with my peers is like, in order to like avoid the uncertainty of like having to try different things, they almost just like settle for something that's just like, all right. But, um, and so for me, I never wanted to do that. Like, I think to your point and to your question, I, kn- I kind of knew early on, like even when I was in school that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, it was just a matter of timing of like, when was the right time to do it? Um, I think one of the things that we hear a lot, we, we obviously hear these stories of people who are like, uh, even like the Gary V story of like, um, he was just like a born entrepreneur. Like he was like flipping shit as like a kid. Yeah. And then like, dr- he doesn't really like university. And then he takes over like his dad's like liquor store. And like, he's like a born entrepreneur. Um, or even like the stories of like Mark Zuckerberg, like he just drops out of school and like starts this massive business. Like we hear a lot of stories about like, it's like you're either an entrepreneur or you're not. Um, and I think some for some people like that's their path like they're entrepreneur right from the start I think for other people it's like 
you work for a number of years, you like develop skills, you figure out what you like. And then once you have that clarity, you're like, okay, I'm going to go all in on this. And that was kind of my path. Like I had tried to start businesses in university and they just didn't work. Um, so I knew that I needed more experience. Like I needed experience in the real world. And to be honest, like, even though the, the strategy consulting thing wasn't really for me, it was still like a really valuable piece of the story. Um, and like, it did help me realize to your point, like I really value autonomy. Um, when I feel like personal responsibility for things, it like keeps me engaged. Like it's, if I don't really feel like I have any impact on the thing, I'm like, why am I going to put everything into this? Like, it's not even my thing. Like, um, but that's me personally. I think everyone needs to, to figure it out for themselves. Yeah. And I think you make a really valuable point about like, even though consulting wasn't maybe your thing, you still learned a lot from it. And I was, I was like writing tweets this morning just for fun. And I was reflecting on a lot of my past jobs and experiences. Like I've hustled and was a door dasher that taught me like how to hustle. I was mm. a waiter, which taught me like people skills and how to talk to people, which I think helps with this podcast. I was, uh, um, working a finance internship, which taught me like discipline and showing up every day. So it's like these experiences that maybe aren't our end goal. Like they, they do shape us in ways that we can't, can't imagine for sure. Um, yeah. and it's interesting how like one thing leads to the next. And now you've like really stumbled across something that it seems like you love with podcasting and you've, you've gotten really big time guests. You're at, um, uh, how many episodes are you at now? Um, so I published, um, 30 so far um but I have a bunch in like the stash um obviously like I left my job recently so there's been like a there's been a transition and I'm also like I'm just changing a number of things with the podcast um even one of the it, it's funny actually I'll tell you this story um one of my goals when I first started I like to like put out these big goals in public and then I feel like it encourages me to have the follow-through social so had, contract yeah exactly yeah, exactly 100 percent. so I put out like this listener target and then after I put it out I was like um I came across you know Danny Miranda yes um, literally he was the last person I recorded with last week and then you so two podcasts okay sick yeah. okay sick sweet, sweet sweet he's a great guy um but I had stumbled across his podcast like or his account on Twitter um and I saw his pod and like some of the guests and this was maybe like six to nine months ago um I'd seen some of the guests he was getting and just like his energy as well like the guy was like a hustler like I like it when oh, yeah. I speak to people who are like just fucking hustlers like just get at it um and I remember hitting him up I dm'd him I was like I was um I was like I have this listener target I was like, um, do you have like any tips on like how I can do it or whatever? And he just sends me his phone number. He's like, just give me a call. So I like call him off. I'm like, oh, that's like a bit different. Like usually people don't just give the number or whatever. Um, and we're talking and I ask him and I'm like, how, like, how did you reach these number of listeners on your pod? Cause it's really difficult to grow pods, like to grow a podcast mm -hmm. to get listeners. Um, and he just like doesn't answer my question at all. And he's like, he's like, you have to be willing to do it for 10 years, man. Yep. And I was like, what? And then he's like, yeah, it's like, if you're going to like be successful in this, like you have to be willing to do it for like a long period of time without seeing results. And like, um, it's funny. Cause like in hindsight, like he exactly answered my question, which is like, you have to love it. Like it all starts with the fundamentals, like the foundation. You have to really love what you're doing. And if you really love what you're doing, you'll be able to do it for a long enough period of time without seeing results. And it's like this ironic thing. It's like when you don't really care about seeing results and you just care about making the quality of your content better each time, you the results just come because it's like inevitable. Um and I think that's something that I've like always wanted to be like, I want to be like inevitable, like undeniable. Like it would just like, I couldn't be stopped. Like the way I was working, it was just inevitable. Yeah. I'm the same way. And that's why I love podcasting as like a medium or an art form, because it is such a long game. Like you could have a TikTok video blow up and you're viral overnight. Right. But like, mm. did you really earn that success or notoriety? Whereas in a podcast, like the average person probably listens to like five or 10 podcasts and to be one of those podcasts in their listening routine, like 
you have to be pretty good. Um, mm. It's like the top couple percent of podcasters get all the views and listens. And to make mm. it into that top percent, like you have to be willing to put in the work for such a long period of time. And another thing that I love about podcasting as a medium is like, through these conversations, you're learning so much and you're leveling up your own knowledge. Like yeah. I'm learning so much from this conversation already. And imagine in 10 years, if you have a thousand episodes recorded and they're an hour each, like you're, you're going to be nearing mastery of this craft and you're going to be learning from so many different people. So that's why I think podcasting is, is such a good move in the long term. Mm. Like in my opinion, there's really no downside to starting one. Now, maybe like you said, everybody expresses their, their uh, interests differently. And some people like to write, some people like to, to talk to people, but it's just a great way to like improve your social skills and make connections and learn something. And yeah. then maybe in 10 years, you never know where it leads. hundred percent. I, I think the other thing as well, like um, it's really underrated. Like, even if you don't, even if you don't want to build an audience, like, even if you don't really care to like have a bunch of listeners and all that stuff, it's still really worthwhile doing a podcast. And for the audience, I'll tell you the reason why, which is like, say that there's like a business person online that you want to reach out to, that you want to grab a coffee with, or like jump on a call with. If you reach out to them and you're like, oh, I found you interesting. Like, would you be down to like grab a coffee sometime? Like, that's not really that compelling for them mm -hmm. because most people that are doing cool shit, like their time is really valuable. So for them to just speak with you one-on-one, -on -one, like they might even really like you, but it's not that compelling for them unless you have something to directly offer. Whereas like if you have a podcast and you can write them a message and be like, this is what the pod's about. Um, these are some of the guests we've gotten. Like, would you be interested in coming on? that that's a compelling offer because then not only are they speaking with you, they're making content that can then be distributed. And then you have an audience as well. So it's like the content is helping way more people than just you. So even just purely from like a networking, just meeting people perspective, like take the audience, take the listeners out of it. There's so much value in having a podcast and just doing it regularly. Um, like, really underrated like i i can't stress that enough i 100 percent agree and i was talking with danny about this last week and he was kind of elaborating on that point of like if you were going to just go talk to somebody one-on-one -on -one, like after the conversation's over it's over like nobody's ever going to listen to it but with this podcast this thing will be on the internet for as long as the internet exists right so like mm. somebody 70 years from now can look back like Callum Johnson in 70 years, one of the greatest podcasters of all time or so uh, and be like, so and be like, Oh, <laughs> he, came, he came on this podcast like 70 years ago in his early days. Like I want to see what he was talking about then. So like the leverage behind it is insane. And then mm. the genuine connections you make too, it's, it's really irreplaceable. Like for example, I'm trying to basically escape the corporate world and potentially leaving college to pursue this online stuff full time. But like, I can't fund the podcast and this stuff completely just through the podcast. I'm not making money from it. Like it's more so for fun right now, but mm. something that has come out of it that I never would have expected is I made a really genuine connection through a guest on this podcast. And now I'm helping him with content creation strategy and like consulting and writing for him and getting mm. paid for that so that I can fund this podcast. And like, I would have never made that connection had I not just started the podcast and, and uh, asked him to come on. So like, mm. it's really irreplaceable leverage and connections. Yeah, that's sick, man. Um, you know, you know, what's funny. It's like, uh, this is actually the first podcast that I've done, like where I'm the one being interviewed, but like, cause I'm so used to interviewing. It's like, as you're speaking, I have like questions. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm like, um, and one of the things I was going to say, uh, you should really break down like the leverage thing, because the thing I've realized every person that's trying to build like a a business online so so i'll give examples like um i've spoken from like sahil bloom to like jack butcher um like so many like people that have big followings businesses online and they all like understand the concept of like leverage and like compounding on like a really deep level and that kind of like informs everything they do um 
Yeah, totally. And I remember hearing about the concept of leverage from Naval like a couple months ago when I started listening to him and I, I didn't understand what it meant. Alex Ramosi would talk about it too. And I just, I couldn't like wrap my head around what it meant, but I'm starting to really understand like the power of it. And the biggest leverage point really in the social media era is your personal brand. And like, if you have the podcast, if you have the Twitter, if you have the newsletter, like it's all these different leverage points that you put, this is basically the, the essence of leverage. So your inputs are not matching your outputs. So like we, we record this episode one time for an hour, but it's being able to be listened to by hundreds, maybe thousands of people. Well, probably not yet, but someday down the road, it could be listened to by thousands, tens of thousands of people. And just by putting in one input, or if, let's say you write a book um, that takes you one time to write the book, but it's distributed thousands, millions of times. So it's basically like your inputs aren't matched your outputs. Whereas in a regular salary paying job, it's like you work one hour, you get this amount of money back. But the people who have the most leverage, let's say Joe Rogan, for example, like the greatest podcaster of all time, he records one episode with Elon Musk for three hours, but that's distributed millions of times across the internet. He's making millions of dollars from that. So like, that's where the concept of leverage really comes in with podcasting for me, but I'm still trying to break it down. Was that your was that your understanding of it? Like after talking to these guys? Yeah, like 100 percent Like essentially, and I learned about it first from uh Naval as well. Uh it's actually funny. Like, I feel like Naval has literally like inspired like a whole generation of like totally. entrepreneurs. Uh like you can just see his like handprints on, on everything. Um but yeah, basically exactly what you said, like. You basically want to do things where your inputs aren't really closely tied to your outputs. So if you look at most jobs, um, your inputs are very tied to your output. So you need to clock in eight hours a day in order to get your salary, or you need to clock in eight hours a day so that you can do the work so that your work will pay you. Um, if you look at the people that have accumulated the most like resources, like wealth, uh, relationships like take Warren Buffett for instance right I was reading something about him like he's a billionaire investor probably like the most successful inv investor um, that guy doesn't even really work really right. like apparently he spends like most of the day like reading and p playing bridge yeah like he doesn't <laughs> even work yeah right and like meanwhile like if you go on the other side if you look on like the other's perspective there's like there's construction workers who are doing like physically rigorous work, like 10 hours a day, like waking up early, um, doing like doing a job that's actually like physically difficult to do. Um, and maybe they're earning like, I don't even know, but like maybe they're earning like 15, 20, 30 bucks an hour. Warren Buffett sits around like reading and playing games and like going on walks and makes maybe like one decision a year, but there's so much leverage behind that one decision. Yeah. It's like a billion dollar move. So it's like, that's basically like the concept of leverage in a nutshell. Like you wanna build uh, skills, resources, um, media is like one of the, the best ways to actually build leverage. So that like, when you make a move, it reverberates like a thousand, a million times bigger than the initial move. Whereas like from, for like 99% of people, it's very, it's like one-to-one. -one. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that kind of breaks it down. Totally. And that's why <clears throat> there's this quote, I'm not going to take credit for it, but it's like, what you work on is much more important than working hard because mm -hmm. objectively, like those construction workers are working a lot harder than Warren Buffett probably. Right. But because mm -hmm. of who he is, because of like the things he chooses to work on, he gets paid exponentially more than them. And mm -hmm. I think that goes back to this Naval concept about like find something that looks like work to others, but feels like play to you. And that mm -hmm. I was listening to one of your podcasts and you were talking about how this for you right now, like you're not even really doing it for the profits. You're doing it because you love it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm curious, like, how did you stumble across that conclusion? And like, when did you know that, okay, like, I'm doing this, this feels like play to me. And like, this doesn't even feel like work. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. So, um, so like, like I said earlier, like when I initially started doing this, um, 
I think an important thing for me is always to be like action first. And, and that's actually a common thread you'll see with people that are um, tend to be like the top performers. They usually default to action. Like I, I had observed that. So, um, and it was actually one of the problems I had with my previous businesses. I spent too much time like thinking and like trying to make things perfect versus just executing and like taking action. So w- when it came to the idea of the podcast, I was like, okay, how can I be super like action focused, action first with this? And that's why I created the goal rather than being like, I'm going to be the biggest podcast in the world or setting some like outlandish target. It was let's just record 10 episodes and then take breaking that down even further. It's like, okay, to record 10 episodes, all I need to do is get 10 guests to agree and put 10 times on the calendar. Like if they're on my calendar, I'm going to do it yeah. because it's more embarrassing for me to like, to to back out of something that someone's agreed to um versus actually doing it so i'm just gonna do it um so i think the i i remember episode like uh the fourth episode that i recorded very vividly um because i would because i worked i would stack the episodes on certain days so because on friday i knew my work was a bit quieter i would like stack episodes on friday so i think this friday uh the friday that i'm referring to I had like three episodes in a day, which is actually not the best way to do it because you're like so fucking tired by the last one. I've done it too. Yeah, it's not fun. <laughs> it's not fun, <laughs> literally. Especially because like if you're the host, you're like really listening to what the person's saying and like it's just harder when you're tired. Um, but anyway, so like I remember this episode, right? Like it was the last episode of the day and I was just like fucking tired. And this... um the guest that I got on, his name is Ruben Harris, uh, is the CEO, founder of this company called Career Karma. And at the time, they had just raised, I think it was like a $40 million Series B round for the company. So he was on like this huge media run. Like he'd been going on like a lot of different podcasts. I think he'd went on like CNBC. And we're literally recording this episode like four o'clock on a Friday. So his whole week has just been like doing media, like having people like grilling him with questions about like his company and the future of it. So by the time he got to me and like, I'm like a small fry. Like, I don't even think I'd I'd released any episodes at this point. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like some kid. (laughs) Um, And like, we get on, like we start recording the episode and I could just, I could just feel his energy. He was just like fucking drained. Like he was like tired. And I think because he was tired, he was just like, he had like an intensity about him. Like I could just tell, like, he just wanted to get it done. And um, I remember like being like very early in the episode, uh, he w- he was giving not like he was giving good responses, but they were like very brief. Like they were like to the point, like right to it. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, like, I'm fucking tired too. So I was like, I'm just going to meet his energy. Like with the same like with the same intensity and we just like it was so authentic the episode and we just discussed like such um real shit and I remember like I came into the episode I was exhausted I left the episode and I was like on cloud nine and I remember I just like reflected on like the energy like how the energy my energy was different and I was like there's very few things that you can do in your life that like you can go into it being exhausted and afterwards feel like energized. I felt like I could go and like, I don't know, fucking like run six miles after I did the episode. And I think that was such a unique feeling. I was like, Oh shit. Like I need to pay attention to this and do it like as many more times as I can. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's such an opposite feeling to what it sounded like you had when you were trying to grow on Twitter and write all those threads, right? Yeah. Every time you're probably drained, like, oh, like this sucks. But like, I know I want to build this personal brand. So like, what should I do? But that's yeah. so cool that you were able to find this, this medium that energized you and excited you. And that's what happens to me often too. Like sometimes I've done the two podcasts in a day, uh, three times, three in a day, one time, just like, because you know, we're, we're early. We got to hustle, but yeah, it's like, you go into the episode, you're like, damn, I have another episode to record. Like I'm so tired, but like, you want to be present and engaged, but then by the end of it, like you're energized as hell. Like yeah. even before this, I was a bit tired. 
Um, but now like I feel energized as fuck. Like I'm so ready to get on with the rest of my day. Like this, this energy, this conversation is energizing Sick. me just because we're in the same headspace in terms of like, I don't know many podcasters in real life. Right. Like yeah. I, I know, I know zero actually. <laughs> no one um, does this shit. I'm not going to lie. No one does this in like exactly. the outside world. <laughs> exactly. And that's the weird thing about social media. It, and I wonder if you feel this sometimes it, it feels like all eyes are on you and like, there's so much pressure and like, everybody knows you in this in this very niche space because i mean a lot of people found you from like sahil bloom or jack butcher and it seems like probably a lot of attention but then you go out in the real world you're like okay like nobody's actually living this life yeah. um which is actually so refreshing for me honestly it's so nice because one time i uh i put out a thread about um jordan peterson's 12 rules for life um yeah. just because it was a great book and it, it really helped with my self-improvement journey and I was getting so many hate comments and I was like, like, damn, like this, this sucks. I feel like yeah. everybody hates me. And so I just turned off Twitter and I went walking around San Francisco and not a single person knew me. And I was like, this, yeah. is, this is really nice. Yeah. Um, so I uh, kind of piggybacking off that, like, let's say you meet somebody in real life right now. Um, mm. When they ask you, what do you do? And you say podcaster, like, what's the normal reaction? Um. <laughs> It's interesting. I think most people are like intrigued, to be honest, mm. just because it's like it's just different. Right. Uh, especially in New York, like everyone, especially like if you meet someone in in Manhattan or just like around the city in general, it will be like you usually hear the same careers. Like it'll be like, oh, I work in tech or like maybe they'll do like fashion or uh, like banking, consulting, law. Like there's kind of these like staples, like there's certain careers you just hear over and over again. Um, and I think podcasting is just kind of different. And like, it's really interesting for me at the point I'm at now, because obviously I left my job uh, to do this full time and like, like made like, that's a big swing, like living in Manhattan and doing that shit is like, it's a ballsy move. Um, and I think the thing that surprised me about it is like the amount of respect people have for it. Mm. And um obviously like on Twitter of course but like that didn't really surprise me so much on Twitter because I feel like the people on Twitter are already minded that way like you're already kind of entrepreneurial you're kind of trying to make something happen for yourself so you get it but people that are actually just um even working in like pretty corporate or like in working in for big companies um I think there's just and it, and it made me realize something I was like there's so many people that they don't really enjoy what they're doing and they would literally love to be able to like leave that and to go all in on something they truly cared about. And even when I was thinking, like I've been doing a lot of thinking since I left about, cause I'm renaming the show. Like I'm renaming the show to the Callum Johnson show. And I was thinking like, who, who is my podcast for? Like, what is it? Like, who do I want to listen to this? Um, or like, what impact do I want to have? And I even said it in one of the episodes I recorded yesterday. I was like, I want people to listen and just feel like they can do whatever the fuck they want. Like yeah. they don't have to, I don't know, like just because their parents think they have to be like a doctor or like a lawyer or an engineer or like a banker or a consultant. Like you don't have to do that. Like you can do whatever you want, providing you're willing to put the work in behind it. And then... I want you to listen to my podcast and you feel like, fuck, like I'm literally hearing stories from people that just did whatever they wanted and succeeded. And this is motivating and inspiring me and like showing me how I can do that in my own life. Um, so yeah, like it's, it's definitely a mixture. I think it's like intrigue. Um, there's like a respect. I think there's some people that probably think I'm like fucking crazy, but like definitely, definitely. Comes it. It That's comes what comes with it. with it at first, I guess. And then they'll yeah. see you in a couple of years and be like, damn, like he's so lucky. You're like, he had he was an overnight success, but they don't yeah. see the early days of like the work behind the scenes. Um, yeah. and so you were in these corporate environments for a while, and you mentioned that you think a lot of people are probably unhappy in these jobs and like they wish they could make the switch, but like they just don't take action. So why do you think what do you think is holding them back from like believing in themselves and taking these leaps? Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult, man. Like I think as uh there's definitely like a nuance to it. Like I think it's different um, 
for every single person. And I will say this, like, I completely get it. Um, like, it was not, it was not an easy decision. And, and that's with me, like, knowing that I wanted to do this thing. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't even know what they want to do. That's, that's the thing I've heard a lot even as well. Like even from people that have been in their career like 20 years, they like, they don't know what they ultimately want to do. Like they don't know the thing that they want to like, um, like they're trying to build a legacy around that they really love putting their time in. So a lot of people just don't know what they would leave for um, even to begin with. So like, I get, I get how difficult it can be. Um, I think it's just... I don't know, man. It's so, it's so difficult to say. I feel like it's like, there's a confidence element to it. Uh, Yeah. And like a belief in yourself because you see all these people maybe taking these leaps of faith and starting their own thing, but like, why would I be able to do it? Or like, I couldn't be successful or I couldn't ever be like them. But in reality, I think it goes back to your point about like not knowing what to do. Mm. And how would you know what to do if you never take action on anything? Right. Mm. So like you could be working a corporate job, you can be in college, but what's worked for me at least and how I've stumbled down this path and found that like, I really think this is my calling in life to like do this type of stuff is just work on stuff on the side, like start a blog, start something on the side that intrigues you. And maybe it won't be the thing that you actually end up leaving your job for, but then you can just knock it off the checklist and be like, okay, I tried this. I didn't like it. What's another thing I can try. And I I don't think you can ever just sit there and like think, and then like magically come to the conclusion, like, oh, I'm going to become a podcaster. I think you stumble down that slippery slope over time just by taking action. And another thing with the confidence piece, I'm reading a book about confidence right now by James Smith. Um, Have you heard of him? He's a podcaster from the UK. He does sound familiar. So he's been on the Chris Williamson. uh, Oh yeah, I know. know. He's been on Chris Williamson a lot. And I've really like been obsessed with this guy over the past couple of days. Um, And he talks about how confidence is not built by like just self-belief or talking to yourself action actually precedes confidence and like you don't even have to be confident to take the action but if you just take some small action if you just put one tweet out there if you just decide to record one podcast or like try to start a business like in your free time on the weekend you never know where that can lead you um but i think we get so caught up in like oh what can go wrong or like i'm not really sure if this would work out so we don't even start so like yeah why did you just say fuck it and start like was there a fuck it moment for you yeah just just before i get to that just quickly yeah. I, I love the point that you made um and i it reminds me of this quote i saw from alex homozi where he talks about self-doubt because one thing i will say um i think the other thing like even to your earlier question of what is people's reactions when i say i do like a podcast um people think that you're also like very confident like they'll be, I think they just think there's a lot of, they're like, wow, you're so confident that you would just do that. Yeah. And it's not, I, I think I am confident, but I don't think that's actually the reason because even for me, you go through moments of like a lot of self-doubt on the journey where you're like, what the, f-? like, I'm yeah. literally like, it's like, it's like midnight and I'm like here editing like some podcast clip and I have like a meeting tomorrow morning, like a really important meeting tomorrow morning. Like, what am I doing? Like you'll, yeah. you'll have moments where you're just like, and even now that I'm not working, I'm like, wait, I left my job that was like paying well in Manhattan with like pretty like decent, even work-life balance to earn zero dollars doing a podcast. Like what am I, like you have moments of self-doubt. And I remember what Alex Amosi said, he's like, the only way to overcome self-doubt is to build mountains and mountains of undeniable proof that like you can execute and get things done. Um, And that's the thing, man. Like, I think a lot of people doubt themselves and they don't think they can do it. And I think they think the re- the way that they can overcome that is through like, I don't know, like thinking. I, and, and to be honest, I, I used to be like this. Like I would just overthink a lot and I'd be like, oh, I just need more time. I hear that a lot from people. They're like, I just need more time or I'll do it in a few months or I'm just working on this little thing. And like, when that's perfect, then I'll do it. Like everything is just give me more time. And I think my thing that I'm always telling myself is like, like you need less time. Like you need to get to it quicker. Um, 
and to be honest you're going to get to a point and I remember someone gave this analogy which is like a lot of the I think Naval said this he was like um a lot of suffering happens in the space between when like you have a thought and then when you take action so for most people like you're you'll have a thought especially if it's like something you haven't done before you'll have a thought and then you'll be hesitating for a really long time mm-hmm. then you'll take action and that period of hesitation um that is suffering like that is the most pain that you're experiencing is like thinking what could happen and like if you think about it right like if i was going to tell you that i don't know your house might be like on fire and you were just thinking about that and all your belongings maybe like family members whatever that would probably be like a scary thing to think about if your house was just on fire in the next second you probably actually wouldn't be afraid you would just be thinking about how do i escape the fire like you're just in the moment you're just taking action to escape and i think i think a lot of it when you're getting started is like you almost at least this is how i think about it because i'm an overthinker is I want to overwhelm my brain with just action. And the thing is, is like, everything's about momentum. So once you start taking action, you're going to start taking more action. Um, Like even with the podcast, right? Like if you record, if I get an interview on the calendar, me taking the action to set up that interview now means I need to record the interview. Now that it's recorded, I now need to publish the interview. Now that it's published, I now need to market the interview. I have a fucking podcast from basically like it all just led to that. Yeah. Um, You leave yourself no choice when you just do the little tiny action at first leads to the big action because by you just reaching out and asking somebody to come on the podcast, now you're somebody who actually has a podcast, right? But like mm. when you think about the end goal of like, I'm going to have a podcast episode of the Sahil Bloom, like on the internet, that sounds crazy to think about. But when you break it down to that first step of like, I'm just going to reach out to Sahil Room, then you kind of like trick yourself into completing the big action just by taking little actions. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I love that. 100% man. And like, um, and I think that's the thing, the thing, the thing that you don't want to do, you don't want to put, and and we all do it to a certain degree. um, But don't like those people that you look up to or admire, um, don't think that you're like any different than them or like they're just like some different kind of human being. Like everyone's dealing with the same shit. Like um, Joe Rogan, before I'm sure before he gets on an interview with like an Elon Musk or some like really high level guest, I'm sure there's a certain level of like imposter syndrome or like yeah. I'm going to speak to three, like with Elon Musk for three hours and like I commentate on the UFC and like, <laughs> But like, what the fuck? Like, what am I going to, like, what am I going to do? Like everyone has like the doubt or um, like moments where they're not super confident. But I think the people that get shit done, they just step forward anyway. Like they just make it happen anyway. Um, And if you do that enough times, you'll do whatever you want, right? Like you'll be like one of the best podcasts, if that's your thing. You'll be like, I don't know one of the best in your like career or field uh you'll move to that new location that you dreamt of living in um yeah you just have to step forward yeah and I think it can be applicable outside of just podcasting and I'm trying to do this in my own life so like for me right now to hop on a podcast with like you or Dakota or Danny Miranda like at first that would have sounded really scary but now it's like, okay, it's just a conversation. It's what I do. But Mm. like, if you tell me to go approach a girl in a coffee shop, I'm going to be way more scared than having this conversation. Right. And it's because that's the thing about confidence. You just have to take action. And I I heard this from uh, one of the self-help guys I look up to a lot, Hamza. Um, He talks about like, break down this action into little actions again. So let's say approaching a girl in the coffee shop, like instead of thinking about like, what am I going to say? All these things and making it such a big problem in your head, the first step is just command your legs to walk over to her. Like even, <laughs> it, it sounds insane, but like, That's just sick, I like that. trick your brain and be like, I'm just going to walk in this direction and then I'll take the next action when I get there. Um, and so that's what I, like, that's something that I've struggled with the past couple of years is like confidence talking to girls. But 
I'm learning a lot from just talking to people on this podcast. Like, damn, if you just take the little action, it actually becomes easy. Cause now like having these conversations, I actually look forward to it. Um, yeah. Whereas like, yeah. if I, if I'm supposed to go talk to some girl, it's like, I'm overthinking it so bad. Yeah, no, I have exactly the same thing. I, it's funny when I, when I did my, uh, the episode with Dakota, uh, I remember us joking. Cause we were like, um, guys can literally make like five figures a month. Like, I think he was making them like, um, maybe like 50,000 a month or some, something like that. Yeah. It's like, you can make like 50,000 a month, like figure out how, how to do that on the internet at like 23, 24 years old. But like that girl at the coffee shop or like that girl <laughs> at like the next seat over, right. like, how the, f- like, what the fuck do I say? Exactly. It's like, but we, to be honest, I have exactly the same thing. It's like, you do things that are like, um, like we all, like, these are like human problems. Um, and that's the thing, like, I, um, I even tell myself, because uh, one of the things that will always make me procrastinate is like, when, when you're afraid of something, you'll tell yourself you're not ready or like, you don't know what to do. Um, and one thing I always tell myself, I'm like, you already have everything you need. Like when it comes to even like going up to talk to a girl, it's like, how many girls have you spoken to in your life? Like how many conversations have you been involved in in your life? You, like, what do you mean you don't know what to say? Like, you already have everything you need. Like, you already, like, you already do shit. Like, if you're if you're confident as well, like, if you're already building stuff in your life, you're working out, you're doing cool shit. It's like, what do you mean you're not ready? Like, you already have it. It's like, even with the, even with the podcast, like, I've recorded 30 episodes, right? But I've had thousands of conversations in my life. Mm-hmm. Like, I have so many, like, experiences of talking with people. So it's like, yeah, maybe I haven't done hundreds or thousands of podcasts but the exact skill set that you and I are using right now I've already displayed it thousands millions of times so I think if you can just one thing I try to do for myself is just get out of that mindset of like I'm not ready or I'm not the person yet or I need to I don't know I need to build this first before I can do that it's like nah you're ready like right fucking now like you can just do it now exactly or or you could even think about it from the flip side, like you're never going to be fully ready. You almost have to trick yourself into being ready. And that's yeah. what I love about social media, because if you put out on the internet, like I'm doing a podcast and you put it out there to like, let's say you have thousands of followers, like you have no choice now, but to do it. Right. Yeah. And that's what I love about the internet. Like you can hold these social contracts to yourself um, just through like the amount of people that are reading your stuff. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I love. I, I'm not gonna lie. I love that um, that quote you said of like the Hamza thing of uh, like command your legs. <laughs> command to go your up. legs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sounds so weird, but if you think about it, it's like that is actually the first step. Like that is the f- smallest first step you could take. Um, so I'm gonna try that again today. I actually, <laughs> dude, this is this is another social contract thing, and I'll just be super open and vulnerable here. So yeah. since I've had this like this self-doubt and overthinking when it comes to approaching girls. I have a deal with two of my friends on Twitter, Tyler, who I actually grew up with, and Fernando, who's from the UK, Fernando Chow Zhang. And for every day I don't approach a girl, I have to pay them $10. Oh, and so okay. it's like these social contracts are, are so important because it's like, okay, would I rather get rejected by this girl potentially, which wouldn't even necessarily happen, but would I rather risk rejection or would I have to pay my friends $20 a day? So it's yeah. like tricking yourself into action. Uh, <laughs> That's yeah. jokes. Come on those legs, man. Come on. Those I got command them. <laughs> um, I want to switch a little bit now into like the actual art of podcasting. So like, do you have a pre-podcast routine? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I do have things that I'll like do before. So to every guest that comes on the pod, I'll send them like a list of, so like I'll send them a list of questions um, or like topics that we're going to cover. Um, and I actually don't do that for myself, really. I do that more for them. Um, and the reason why is I remember, so one of the first guests that I got on um this guy called Chris uh, Hladzak, uh, pretty big account on Twitter, actually. Uh, really cool guy. Went to Yale, uh, then went to Goldman Sachs, and now he works at a startup. But when he was at Yale, um, he used to run their podcast for like their entrepreneur society. 
and he interviewed like some really big people uh like michael seibel um he interviewed emmett Shear, who's like the i think the president or ceo of twitch um and i remember asking him i was like what did you do before the episode because sometimes with these guys like they because your podcast isn't like a massive thing to them yet so like you'll be getting like rescheduled like on their calendar a lot or like they'll be moving the time or um sometimes they'll even just miss it completely and i was like how do you like what what is your routine like what do you tell them um before an episode and he was like i will research and write out what i think are like the 20 most interesting questions that I could possibly ask this person. I'll write it as like a list. So it's like concise. Um, and I'll send it to them a few days before the interview. And I remember one of the things, like one of my pushbacks to him was like, I don't do my podcast that way. Like I don't, like I'm not reading off like a question list. So like, I don't want them to think that like, I'm only going to ask these questions. And he was like, He's like, don't worry about that. Like most of the time, uh, they won't even read the questions themselves. And you're not even doing it for that reason. The reason you're doing it is to show that you're prepared. Like one of the, and I remember he said to me, he's like, you need to think about it from the guest's perspective. Um, if I'm like a CEO or I'm like running something or I have a, like, I have a business or I'm a creator or I'm doing cool things in my life um, and I don't have much time, the thing that makes me like most nervous about doing a podcast is that it's just going to be a complete waste. Like the guy has no idea what I do. Like the conversation's going to be like awkward. Like it's not going to flow. And so as the host, part of even like podcasting before the podcast is you want to reassure the guest. And when you send them like 25 questions, which are like kind of unique, they're not like the standard things then the guest, even if they don't read it, they're like, oh, this guy's prepared. Like, we're going to have a good, con like, even if he just goes off the list, we're going to have a good conversation purely off that. And so ever since then, uh, in like a practical sense, that's what I'll do before every podcast. I think for me, that's for the guest. For me personally, I just try and put myself in a headspace to have a really good conversation. So that usually is like... Um, like I meditate every day. Um, this sounds so like spiritual and like weird, but like I, I meditate, I go on walks. This sounds like the classic like Twitter shit. I feel like you hear. Hey dude, I'm the exact <laughs> but, same way. I, like, trust me. I'm in the same spot as you. Like before a pod, I mean, actually every day I've been trying to meditate for like 30 minutes every morning. And then I'll like try to take a cold shower walk like try to get really present i don't think it's weird at all i think it's necessary because i think yeah. to have a good conversation you don't want to be thinking about like oh what do i have to do later like oh i have to address this text message oh like what should i say next like i think for me the biggest thing is like being really present something yeah. that i'm learning from you is like okay like for the guest to come and like really be like damn this is going to be a really good conversation send those questions out, like really show that you're prepared. Cause I do do that on my own, but I don't share it yeah. with them because I don't want my, my thought process there was like, I don't want them to be overthinking the answers to the questions. Um, yeah. but at the same time, it does show like, okay, you're taking this seriously. I should too. Yeah. To be honest, I find, and like maybe because I get a lot of like founders and, and CEOs on, on my pod, I'm not going to lie. These guys like don't have enough time to like overthink my podcast yeah <laughs> like they're not like they don't have because uh, it's a good it's a fair point but like they just don't have time to be there like oh I wonder what I'm gonna say to like this question um and yeah it, it's I think one of the things that is really underrated is like the frame of mind that someone um enters a conversation with so like for me I was thinking about it like I want them to be excited like, I don't just, I don't even want them to be probably like on, if you don't send questions, they're probably at best, they're just like neutral. They're just mm -hmm. like, eh, they're like, I don't really know what this is going to be like. Like, it might be good. It might be bad. Um, but if you send the questions and you show that you've like the level of preparation and they have to be good questions as well, that's like a key yeah. thing. Um, then they're going to be like, oh shit, like this is going to be like worth my time. And then like 
I think for me, it's always about the audience. Like the audience is going to feel that energy of like, this guest is actually excited. Like this feels like a good conversation. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And that's something that I've been trying to incorporate more. So it's like, okay, how can I hook somebody in like a good Twitter thread? Like it's going to hook the reader in. So they're ready. They want to read the rest. I think maybe a podcast is the same way. Like how do you hook a reader or a listener in right away? And I think it's starting off with like some type of hard hitting question to really jump into it. Um, Mm. I've had a tendency to just be like, Hey, how's it going? But like, like at this, like that's kind of boring, right? Like I want to get to the hard hitting question first. Yeah. Um, I'm like exactly the, I had exactly the same thing. I'm really? like, uh, well, I, I'm like, um, cause I tried different things with the intro, right? Like I tried, cause you'll see some podcasts and they'll literally just start and they'll be like, can you introduce yourself? And like, I do have episodes where I'll do that. I'll be like, oh, like, can you just introduce yourself to the audience? Cause sometimes it's nice to have that context. Um, but I do really enjoy quite uh, like interviews where they start with like, it's like they start with like fire like they just yeah, yeah, you can yeah. just like they're not playing like they're getting right. right to it like I kind of like that so now I'm just like okay what is the best like what is the most interesting thing about this person like I want to ask that straight away like I want that to be like where we start yeah and then everything else and like their story and everything else can kind of fit around that right but it's kind of just cool to just start with it just get at it Totally. Yeah. I got to keep working on that. Like, how do I come up with the best question to start? Um, I'm also curious though, how do you balance like being super well-prepared and like thinking about all these questions with being present and like letting the conversation flow naturally? Yeah, that's a good question, man. Um, I think for me, and this is what I'll say to people actually, uh, even just taking it past podcasting, you kind of need to understand like who you are and like what you're good at. And that might sound like very philosophical given what you um, just asked, but like, here's what I, here's what I mean. I think maybe after the first like 10, 20 episodes, I kind of started to get a sense of like what my style is and like what I'm good at. And for me, my thing that I want to be known for and like just be really good at is this like Callum, like this guy just has amazing conversations um he's not the guy um like i've listened to other podcasters where there's other things that they do really well like they're super well researched like they they will call back they will reference something that the guest said like 10 years ago in some interview and like on a minute 52 of like a hour and a half podcast and they will ask them about it and like that's their thing like they're super well researched and that's cool like I admire that like that's really cool that you can do that but that wasn't me like I'm not the I'm not I'm not like I research all of my guests and like I put the time in but I'm not trying to be like the most I don't know like meticulous with the research and like knowing the backstory I think the thing for me that I really wanted it's like um it's all about authenticity. So for my audience, like I want to bring you really interesting guests and we're going to go into their story. And the same time that you're learning about their story, I'm also learning about their story. And you're going to, you're going to be able to feel that perspective. Um, And you're, and like the, the experience that I want to give is almost like, um, and this is even a big reason why I wanted to move to doing it in person I want you to feel as if like you're in the room with us and maybe you just pulled like a chair out and you're just sitting in the corner and you're like almost like eavesdropping on the conversation. Like, I don't, I don't want you to feel like, um, like, Oh, this is just like another podcast that I'm listening to. Or this is like, I don't even like the word interview. Like I try to take that like out of my, my vocabulary. It's like, it's not an interview. It's like a conversation. Um, and so for me, it's like, I know that the the preparation thing and like going super detailed on preparation, that's not my thing. Like I'm going to do, I'm going to know who the guest is. Um, I wouldn't even ask a guest on if I didn't like already know their story or their background quite well. Um, I'm going to have thought about like, where do I want to go broadly, but I'm not going to come in with some super specific list. Um, And it's funny, man, like some, like a lot of the best podcasts follow like a similar method like I don't think Rogan comes in with like a question list 
I think that yeah, I was just, you know. I was just gonna say that. Like, I think that's what people love about Rogan is he's just having a conversation, and you just happen to be there listening, right? Mm. Like he and the thing about him that's so genius, like he gets his guests high and drunk, so then they're just super <laughs> open, and then he can like really get into their story. And I might try to do that. Someday yeah, I need to introduce that into the. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know how we do it virtually, but uh, I think that's another advantage to in person, yeah. um, because you get like. Elon Musk, he gets Elon Musk smoking weed on his podcast. Like, how does that happen? But then yeah. people are able to relate to him so much more and they start to become huge fans of this guy because they actually see him as like a genuine person having that a conversation, person. right? Yeah. Rather than an interview. And it's interesting that you came to this conclusion um, and you kind of say like, you find your voice through it. And that's mm -hmm. what I've noticed for myself. It's like at the start, I didn't know if I was just going to be an interviewer. And I felt like, okay, like if I'm just going to be an interviewer, like, I feel like a bit of an imposter. Like I'm kind of just using these people's names to get clicks or something. But when it's an actual genuine conversation and like you're mutually learning from each other, I think it's a more enjoyable experience, at least for myself, um, which I think will help me to create more and more episodes as I go and not burn out. But also for the guests, like, I mean, for, from my perspective, like my favorite podcast to listen to are the ones where people are just chopping it up and like having a yeah. conversation about some really cool stuff. And I want to do that myself. Um, and it is interesting how you start to figure that out just by taking action again, like we said, like you find your writing style, not by thinking about what, I, what is your writing style, you find your writing style by writing, you find your yeah. conversation podcasting style by just doing the doing the podcast. Um, yeah. So that's why like taking action is huge. Yeah. And, and that's the thing, like if you, if you take the, we always come into things with like all of these questions, the questions will like the answers will become clear. Like if you take action and you're present enough to be like, I don't know, at least reflecting on your experiences or learning from what you're doing, uh, the answers will be clear. Like you don't need to worry about that. It's really the, um, the action piece, command those legs. It's really that. That's what it is. Mate. <laughs> I love how that's sticking with you so much. That's yeah, so that, funny. Is, that is, is good stuff. Um, that's hella funny. Um, but kind of going off this podcasting thing, like, who are some of these podcasters you really look up to? Like, who do you, who do you look at? And you're like, I want to try to be like them someday, but maybe a, your own taste on it. It's hard, man. Like, to be honest, for me, I kind of take, there's not one person that I'm like, this guy exactly gets it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's funny, like Naval has this quote where he says that I've always kind of look to which is escape competition through authenticity and so the only thing I try and do each episode I just want to become a more I just want to show like my true character like I just really want to become like more authentic with every episode so that's really like what I aspire to be um is I want I want the audience to feel like you're getting a dose of my true personality every time um but that said I do take elements from like a bunch of different pods. And so like I can give a few examples. I think um, I do like Rogan from the perspective of just like, it just feels super casual and yeah. it just feels like, uh, it just feels like a conversation. It almost feels like two friends. And that is a very, that is a very powerful skill set because I'm sure like before even the episode he recorded with Elon Musk, I'm sure he's not, he's not really like boys with Elon Musk. No. Like, I don't think they're like, they know each other like that. But then when you see him on the pod, you're like, oh, this guy seems, they look could be friends or something. Or like, yeah. he just has that ability. Um, and like, it's a, it's a skill to be able to make people feel immediately comfortable. Most people cannot do that. So that is something that I do think about. Like, I'm like, um, I want my guests to like immediately be comfortable and almost forget that the cameras are there and that it's just, it's just them and I. Um, so that is one thing I take from Rogan. Um, another one is I like, um, I've always really admired Sean Puri from, from my first million more so just the way that he's able to tell stories, like uh, in the way that he's able to like break down concepts. Mm -hmm. I just love the way that he like explains shit because he almost reminds me of like um even when you go to school 
like even when you were like younger and you go to school, certain people are able to tell stories just naturally so well. Like they make you, they could be talking about like, I don't know, getting on the bus to go home, but they'll make it sound like this was the craziest shit that you ever did. And like the way they'll break it down, you're like, you're like, I want to get the bus with that guy next time. Like you're like, right. It's just, um, and I feel like he has that ability, like he kind of breaks things down in a way where it just, it feels like kind of casual, but like interesting, but not overdone. It's a, it's a very fine line. And then um, also I, I watch so many podcasts, man. Like a, a big thing for me, actually, I watch a lot of like the sports talk shows. Um, I don't know if you know, like uh, like First Take, Oh yeah, uh, with like Stephen A. Smith or like Undisputed with like Skip and Shannon. Dude, I um, used to be the biggest Skip and Shannon fan. Like I would yeah. watch those guys for hours. I don't really watch them anymore, but I was yeah. obsessed with Shannon Sharp. I, that dude yeah. is awesome. <laughs> yeah, and to be honest, I, he's one of the guys I definitely look at just because he. The thing with him though, he's like a unique personality. Like, yeah, most think- people can't be that funny. Like, you can't just be, he's just funny. Um, and, and I think that's the thing about all these people you mentioned, like him, Skip, Stephen A in the sports world, and then Rogan and like all these podcasters. I think what makes them so good is they're so unique and authentic to themselves. And that's why yeah. I love your answer about like you take inspiration from these people, but at the end of the day, like you just want to become the most authentic version of yourself. And that's why people love them um, because yeah. they're not trying to be anybody else. Like Stephen A is just unapologetically himself and he's very, he's polarizing in a way. Like some people think he's annoying as hell. I sometimes yeah. do, but at the same time, like other people love him and think he's hilarious. Um, and that's yeah. just because he's so authentic. So yeah. I, I love that. And I you, think you, you find that authentic voice just by doing it for years. Like you just figure out who you are through taking action. Yeah. And, and you know what I love about them as well? It's like, it's just the charisma. And like, um, I remember I even had this, I put out a tweet and I was like, um, if you are being truly authentic to yourself, you should be naturally polarizing. And what I mean by that is like, if you're really being yourself, some people are going to love you and like really fuck with you and be like, this guy is great. And I really resonate with him. I'm going to watch all his stuff. Some other people are going to be like, this guy is cringy or like, this guy is just not, I don't really like it. I think the moment where you're not um, being authentic is when everyone just kind of like, like oh yeah, like I, I like him or like, he's all right. Or like, they just, it's almost like just neutral. Everyone just yeah. feels just neutral. And all of those names that you said, right? Like Skip, Shannon, Stephen A, Rogan. Um, another one that came to mind. I don't know if you know Andrew Schultz, the yeah. comedian. Yeah, he's hilarious. Uh, yeah, he's he's really funny. I, I really like him as well. Um, and like all of those people, they all you're gonna have an opinion on them. You're gonna be like, you're gonna be like, I hate Skip Bayless. So you're gonna be like, yeah, she's like he's actually has some good stuff. Or like even with Stephen A, you're gonna be like, oh, I hate that guy. But even no matter how you feel you're going to tune in to hear their take. Like if something big happens in sports, you're going to be like, okay, what did Stephen A have to say about it? Like, what did Skip have to say? What did Shannon have to say? Exactly. And that's, and that's the thing. Like you want to be, especially if you're going to be in content, like people should have an opinion on what you're saying. Like people should, there should be some sort of emotion, some sort of feeling um, when they listen to you. So I think, I think that's definitely something that like I try like I want to bring is like if I'm being authentic people should have some sort of reaction good or bad um to the stuff I'm I'm saying and doing and yeah yeah this polarizing concept is so interesting to me and I've just started to like learn about it recently there's a great book called models by Mark Manson um Mm. he also wrote the subtle art of not giving a fuck and this book models talks about this polarity in relation to girls and uh attracting girls and like if you're not polarizing at all, like they're going to be neutral towards you. They're not going to have any emotional response. Whereas Mm. if you're instantly really polarizing and really upfront and like genuinely yourself, they're instantly going to either not like you at all, or they're going to like you. And Mm. that's actually what you want. You don't want to be neutral to people. And I think the same goes for creating online and creating on the internet and podcasting, because 
if you seek to please everybody, like nobody's going to really care. Like no, mm. everybody's going to be neutral and not have an opinion on you. Whereas like, yeah, if you're polarizing, you might have a subsection of people that like hate you for whatever reason, but you're also going to have a lot of people that really love you. And like, I mean, think about the most polarizing people in the world in the past couple of years. Like, like, let's say like Andrew Tate, Donald Trump, like these people, some people absolutely hate them. Like they literally hate them so much, but another small group, of big, big group of people love them. They absolutely love them. So like the more polarizing you are, the more people are going to love or hate you. And that's a line that I think like you have to think about, like how polarizing do I want to be? But again, mm. like, I think you find that just by being genuinely authentic. Yeah. And, and, and it's a very good point. Like it is definitely a line. And for me, I think the thing is with like uh, the Andrew Tate and like Donald Trump thing is they clocked onto that, like the, the polarizing piece and they like, um, they almost like exaggerate it. Like they, oh, yeah. they, they will try to push in your face the thing that is like, that is polarizing because uh, they know that it will get such an outsized result. But I think the reason it gets an outsized result is like, and I use this word all the time. Like anyone that knows me knows I say this word all the time. It's just all about authenticity. I think, um, especially with the way the internet is today and how many, how much content and how many things are out there. It's like, people are just trying to find the shit that is authentic like who's truly being themselves and i really think in like um even where content goes from here i think it's all about like are you really this person are you really authentic even when you look on newspapers and like it's like this celebrity got exposed or this person um revealed or whatever like some scandal the reason why that gets so much traction is because people are looking for like oh, this is the real them, not the person that they're portraying on their social media who seems like perfect with a perfect lifestyle and like gets everything they want. It's this, it's the exposed. And um, I think for me, it's just like, how do I give that to the audience? And I think to be able to give your authentic self to people, especially on a, um, at scale, takes a lot of confidence, man. Yeah, because... Sure. Because if people don't fuck with it, that means they don't like like truly who you are, which is like it can be difficult to take. Um, but I think that's also why there's going to be such outsized results from doing that. Like the people that are the best are going to be the most authentic um, and their audience is going to feel with feel that and like engage with them more heavily because of that. And yeah, I think the winners are going to be the most authentic people. I agree with you there. And to go off that point, just for one last question, like, what can the average person do to get in touch with their authentic self or maybe find their authentic self? Hmm. You know, I think there's different, it's a, it's a good question. I think there's different stages to it. I think, um, I think it starts with also like knowing who you are. Um, and I think knowing who you are, it always starts with action. Like you have to have just experimented and done enough things. And then like you, you, you first need to just build data. Like you need to have data, something that you can reflect on, something that you can analyze. A lot of people are trying to analyze and I've done this. A lot of people are trying to analyze and reflect on like very small sample size. Like you've only tried one thing. Like what are you reflecting on? There's not, there's nothing there. And so you need to build the, the, the data, the experiences first. I think from there, another piece, because I also see people get stuck in just, they purely start doing the action and um, they're always busy. They're always in motion. They're always doing things, um, but they have little direction. Um, and the way that you establish direction, I remember I wrote this in my notes, the way that you establish direction is through creating space in your life. You need to create space so that you can reflect um, so for me, I, I left my job like a couple of weeks ago, about three weeks before I left, I went with my family on a trip to Florida and we were just like in an environment, like it was a lot warmer. There was like more water around everywhere. Um, I wasn't working for like a few days, like three or four days. And it was really 
after that period that I had the realization of like, oh, I need to leave my job. If I had stayed in New York, I guaranteed would not have left my job at this point because I would have just been so stuck doing things. Um, I would have just been in routine. And so I would have just kept doing what I was already doing. And so I think you really need to be able to balance both. You need to be able to balance like the action first, getting those that building that data set and then taking the time to reflect on it. And if you can do that, it will give you a sense of like, okay, I think I'm this sort of person. Like this feels like what is right to me. And then I think once you have a sense of like who you are, I think, um, I feel like it's just about being present and like some of the things that we spoke about earlier. I know for me, it's like that's meditation and going to the gym and like um, even just the way I live my life. And if I know who I am and I'm being truly present to the moment, then who I am should just naturally come out. Um, so I don't know. That's kind of like my rough thought of like how, how you can start to be more authentic um, and then also, I guess, just holding yourself accountable. Like you're not going to be authentic. No one's authentic a hundred percent of the time. There's always going to be times when you like got stuck in your head and like overthought something and didn't go approach that girl. And like, now it's like, you just, you were just sitting there in your head. Right. What, like everyone goes through that. But um, I think if you hold yourself accountable, then like more times than not, uh, you should be, you should be authentic. Dude, those were really valuable insights. We're uh, we're in a very similar headspace with that. Like the only times I've been able to make huge decisions and like really change the course of my life has been by stepping out of a daily routine and like looking at your life from this outsider viewpoint, like this objective mm. viewpoint and really taking that time just to reflect and think and like think about who you are, like where you are in the world. And I think only when you take that time away from the routine, are you able to really look at that objectively? Because when mm. you're caught up in a daily routine and you're just going through the motions, like the days just slip by and you never have a chance to think like, is this really what I want to be doing? Um, mm. And then once you do take that step back, you said this in one of your recent podcasts, like you can have a complete 180 flip, like, mm. and you should have a complete 180 flip if you really take the time to reflect. And mm. I've noticed that um, is such a huge thing in my life. So like every couple of months, I'm going to try to do some type of retreat or like some type of like isolation just to think and reflect and be like, am I on this right path? Um, mm. I think it's so valuable. Yeah. And, and just to add on to that, it's like, you just, you're trying to create distance. Like sometimes mm -hmm. it's very hard to, to plot your course out of a storm when you're stuck in the storm. Sometimes you need to create some distance, give yourself some time, give yourself some space. And I think one of the things, um, I know some people talk about like anti-goals. So like a lot of people obviously have goals, like things they're aspiring to. And the, the concept of anti-goals is like, what are you trying to avoid? Like, what's the thing that you're like, please do not let this happen. And for me, one of those was like, just not realizing my potential or spending a lifetime just doing the wrong thing and like that is a truly scary concept that you could like just be working your whole life like 70 years 80 years and it's just not even the right thing and you're just always in motion you're just always doing this thing and at 60 years old 70 years old you're like why did I do that? Like I got no, I just got a bunch of things that I don't care about. Like, I don't care about this like big house that I have or like whatever, like, and it would be different for everyone. Um, and so I think for me that the, the reflection piece becomes very important because it's like, it's just like, is this really what I want? Uh, and if it's not really what I want and it's not moving me towards that, then um, decisions have to be made and like, I need to change some things up. Yeah, it's honestly terrifying to think in that way, like to use fear setting as uh, mm. I think Tim Ferriss talks about like using fear setting as a means to like take action because you can think like, oh, my life could be better, but like you're not actually going to take action on that. But when you think of the worst case scenario, like what happens if I don't change, like 
that is what sp- like sparked people into action. That's what sparked me into action a couple times in my life. But mm. dude, such valuable insights. Um, this was su- this was such a fun conversation. We're gonna definitely yeah. have to do it again. I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, no, this is really this is really fun, man. And um, yeah, you're good at this shit as well. Like um, yeah, like it was really it was really fun talking to you. I really appreciate that, man. That means a lot. Um, and before we hop off. Like, where can people find your stuff at? I'll link it down below, but. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm on I'm on Twitter. Um, like the Callum Johnson show will be like across all the podcast platforms. Uh, we're on YouTube. The Callum Johnson show uh, will be uploading everything. And like all of our like there's just some exciting shit happening, man. Like all of our episodes are going to be mostly in person from now on. Um, and the energy of the conversations is just going to be different. And yeah like th- there's big stuff uh like i, I want to be like one of the top in this top podcast in this genre um so like in classic callum fashion like i'm putting the goal out there like straight oh, yeah. straight straight up um yeah so th- there's a bunch of interesting shit happening but yeah man i love this i, I love what you're doing um yeah and you're good at this so we, thank you, bro. It really means a lot. And I would say one one last thing before we hop off. Check out this dude's episode with Sahil Bloom. Uh, it's on YouTube in person. That's how I found him. I'm like, this guy, this guy's really good at asking questions. Um, so definitely check thank that you. out. But yeah, we'll have to do this again in the future for sure. For sure, bro. For sure. It'll be cool. Like in a in um after a bit of time, just like see how we're like progressing and shit. And like uh yeah, it'll be cool. I'm in it for the long game, so. We can do it every year for the next 20 years if you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's do it, man. Let's do it. Sweet. All right. I appreciate you.